For the rest of us, the scripture that we will be reading is from the book of Habakkuk. That's right, the book of Habakkuk. So if you can find the book of Habakkuk without looking in your table of contents, then you win, I don't know, I'm not sure what you win. You win the, the gratification of knowing you can find Habakkuk. Habakkuk is about three-quarters of the way, maybe not quite three-quarters of the way through the Bible. And uh, you can, it's in the Old Testament, so if you look in your table of contents, you can find it. So it begins with the letter H, H-A-B-A-K-K-U-K. And uh, Habakkuk is in this section toward the end of the uh, Old Testament that is called the Minor Prophets. And it's called the Minor Prophets not because they're not that big a deal. It's not like they're minor league prophets or something. Um, it's because their books are very short. And they're shorter than the major prophets of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And in our English Bibles, in our Christian Bibles, we throw Daniel in there too, even though in the Hebrew Bible he falls in a different category. But Habakkuk, um, uh, I want you to turn there, and we're going to be in Habakkuk chapter 3. So Habakkuk was a prophet, and we're not sure precisely when Habakkuk lived and did what he did, but we know kind of a general space that he did that. And the way you can find it, if you've got your handy-dandy Bible timeline, if you happen to bring that with you today, um, then uh, the, we, we want to look on the back side of it. So the back side of the Bible timeline looks like this. And Habakkuk lived in this uh, bluish area in the middle, this bluish period of time. And so if you look here in this section, there's a blue arrow that goes up from, from a black line. It goes up this way. And then there's a space, and then there's three more blue arrows that come over here. The blue arrow here represents the destruction and deportation of the people of the northern kingdom uh, of Israel called Israel. And then these three arrows that come off this purple line represent the destruction and deportation of the people of the southern kingdom of the people of Israel, which went by the name of Judah. Habakkuk lived in Judah, the southern kingdom, and he lived in between these periods, most likely. Okay, So that's just to give you a little bit of an understanding of when we're talking about here. So it's sometime between like the 8th and 6th centuries uh, B.C. So I'm going to read uh, what Habakkuk says here in Habakkuk chapter 3, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit. So Habakkuk chapter 3 says this, A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigionoth. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens, and His praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from His hand where His power was hidden. Plague went before Him. Pestilence followed His steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapsed. His ways are eternal. I saw the tents of Kushan in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Were you angry with the rivers, O Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode with your horses and your victorious chariots? You uncovered your bow you called for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by. The deep roared and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear, you pierced his head. When his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. 
You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. I heard, and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones, and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights for the director of music on my stringed instruments. What I want to talk to you about today is when the bad guys win. When the bad guys win. <clears throat> With what happens when the bad guys win and um, we lose. There are different times and places in life where we experience this. A lot of times you might experience this in the workplace where, for example, there's um, somebody who, uh, who gossips, who slanders, who backbites, and they manipulate circumstances to um, increase their power and increase their position at the expense of those who do not do the same thing. Or you might experience it when you get chewed out by your boss for something that you did that was wrong or something that you didn't do that you were supposed to do that you were not properly told about, you didn't know about, that was accidental, that was unintentional, or that your boss doesn't understand the situation, but rather than listen, just uh, goes after you and humiliates you in front of the rest of the office. Or you might experience it in, in other situations, in other settings. You might experience it when um, you're, you're not treated properly by the authorities, when you're um, pulled over and given a citation when you hadn't done anything wrong or when maybe you did do something wrong but somebody else did something more wrong than you and they didn't get busted for it. We experience the bad guys winning when um, we're in a, a, a family situation where there's somebody who um, their own anger, their own abusiveness um, dominates the house dominates the the family and 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 shapes everything that goes on there and we're helpless to resist that painful and difficult and an abusive and toxic situation there are all kinds of situations that we can find ourselves in when the bad guys win and and it's not only personal things but when we look at the world when we look at um, the nation we can see situations where the bad guys win where um, somebody gets away with something, gets to increase their power or um, increase their dominance or exploit others and are not called to account for that. And, and we don't know what to do. and We don't know how to stop it. And it doesn't look like anybody can stop it or wants to stop it or will stop it. What do we do when the bad guys win? How do we approach that? How do we get our minds and hearts and attitudes in the right places when the bad guys win? This is exactly the situation that the prophet Habakkuk was in whenever he lived. If you start in chapter 1 of Habakkuk, basically the way Habakkuk starts is something like this. Habakkuk begins his prophecy by talking to the Lord, by crying out to the Lord and saying, God, the bad guys are winning in Judah. Okay, The bad guys are winning here. We have in Jerusalem, we've got people who uh, are powerful families that they, they, they throw their weight around to manipulate things so that things go well for them and not for other people. You know, it, it's, like, it's like mafia families. These, these violent families that, that, um, that exploit people, that, that take advantage of people, and that they have no recourse, they have nowhere to go, they have no one to call on who's going to rescue them from those who are stronger than they are. We have people who, who um, when they don't get their way, then they use violence. They actually beat or even kill the person who gets in their way, and they're never called to account. There's nobody to stop. It's this dog-eat-dog, dog, only the strong survive you know, kind of situation 
where um, the weak, the poor, those who don't have friends in high places are, are starving, are beaten, are hurt. Okay? This is the sort of thing that's described throughout the prophets. Just this sort of breakdown of society, this sort of degenerating situation where there's no control over the society in such a way that, that um, those who do wrong are brought to justice for the wrong that they do. Because either because the king is too weak or because the king is participating in injustice himself and everything is just breaking down. And so Habakkuk says, how long, Lord? How long are you going to allow the situation to happen while these wicked people here in Judah are exploiting and oppressing everybody else? Okay? And God's answer to Habakkuk is to say, don't worry, Habakkuk. I see what's going on. I know what's going on. I'm going to bring these people to justice. And the way I'm going to bring these people to justice is by bringing the Babylonians, also known as the Chaldeans, who live far to the east of here, and their massive, savage army to come all of this way over here to conquer this land. And they're going to conquer Judah and wipe it out and destroy it and take these very violent people away into exile over to Babylon. That's how I'm going to ensure that they get what's coming to them. So then Habakkuk says, whoa, 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 time out, right? Um, this is a case of the cure being worse than the disease, okay? I mean, these guys that you have, these Babylonians who are going to come and get us, they're actually even worse than we are. I mean, as sinful and as violent and as oppressing as the people of Judah are, the Babylonians are world-renowned for this. I mean, they're doing this on a scale that we haven't even conceived of. I mean, they're, they're being violent and destructive and exploitative and, and rapacious all over the world. And you're going to send them here? How is that any better? How is that any more fair? The bad guys are still winning. God replies to Habakkuk in Habakkuk 2. He says, no, because even though I'm going to use the Babylonians as my tool, as my instrument of judgment on the wicked people of Judah, the Babylonians are going to get theirs. Because eventually, even though they are going to conquer all over the place, eventually their kingdom is going to fall as well. Their empire is going to fall as well. I'm going to send hordes after them that are going to crush them, that are going to bring them low, that are going to destroy and devastate that empire. And so the, the lesson that God is teaching Habakkuk is that when the bad guys win, actually, God wins. When the bad guys win, actually, God wins. Sometimes when the bad guys win, they're actually the tool that God is using to punish other bad guys. But then also, even when the bad guys win, they're not going to win forever because eventually, God wins. Eventually, God wins. Eventually, God is going to redeem and rescue his people, God tells Habakkuk. And he says to the other prophets as well, after all of this happens, after Judah is punished for its sins by the Babylonians, then I'm going to destroy the Babylonians for its sin, and I'm going to bring my people Judah, the remnant that survives, I'm going to bring them back to their land, I'm going to reestablish them, and I'm going to bring my, Messiah, my anointed one, my promised chosen one, who's going to come into this place, who's going to come to his people, and is going to rescue them. And this promised chosen one, we know to be Jesus of Nazareth, who is not only the son of David, the son of Israel's greatest king, the descendant of Israel's greatest king, but was also God's son. And that the way he was going to bring salvation was first and foremost to die on the cross, the, un, the just for the unjust, the innocent for the guilty, so that when God's kingdom came, that those who trust that Jesus is the go-between, that Jesus is the, is the one who takes away the guilt of people before God, can actually have a stake in that new kingdom, a stake in that new and perfect and wonderful world that God is going to bring when Jesus returns again a second time to bring it. So that's the, the message there that's there in Habakkuk. And, and Habakkuk could actually have ended his book in chapter 2. It could have just been a two-chapter book. The, the very end of Habakkuk 2 
um, God says of what value, or, or, per, or perhaps Habakkuk says, thinking about God, of what value is an idol since a man has carved it, or an image that teaches lies? For he who makes it trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life, or to lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver. There is no breath in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Habakkuk concludes this section by saying that, um, that despite the fact that the bad guys seem to be winning, despite the fact that, that things seem out of control, and despite the fact that there are all of these other possible saviors in the form of pagan gods that were represented by statues that people bowed down and worshipped, that nevertheless there was one person out there who, who would win, one person who ensured that things were not all chaotic, but that they were all going to the right end, and that is God, and let all the earth be silent before him. But that's not how Habakkuk ends. Because Habakkuk adds this, this postscript, this epilogue, at the end of his short little two-chapter prophecy. And it is a prayer set to music. And we know that it's set to music. We know that it was a song, even though we don't have the musical notation, because of uh, what it says at the end, that it was written for the director of music to be performed on Habakkuk's stringed instruments. So I don't know if that means that Habakkuk was an instrument maker, Maybe he was. Maybe he was a craftsman who made stringed instruments. Or maybe he was uh, a Levite who um, had a job in the temple of singing there. And so maybe he was the one in charge of the instrumentalists, the harpists and the lyrists uh, there in the temple. We're not really sure. But Habakkuk was a musician. And he writes this prayer that's a musical prayer. It's a song prayer that is his expression, his poetic expression of what he has just learned in this dialogue with Yahweh, God of Israel. And because it's poetry, because it's song lyrics, then it uses all of these um, figures of speech and all of these images that, um, that are not ordinary, normal, everyday things, but, but cast this powerful image, this powerful um, figure or metaphor of God coming to save his people. Now, Habakkuk starts, it says a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigionot. We don't know what Shigionot means, but it seems to be a musical term, so it could mean in the style of Shigionot, whatever that is. Maybe that was a particular style of music back in those days. We're not sure. But he starts out by saying, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day, in our time, make them known. Habakkuk would have remembered and known and, and had passed down and heard and, and even perhaps had read with his own eyes in, in, in the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, what God had done for his people. How God had redeemed them out of slavery in Egypt. And, and brought them back in the, in the 15th century B.C. And brought them out through these awesome plagues, these awesome devastating calamities, disasters that he threw onto Egypt because the Egyptians refused to let these slaves go. And how God brought them out of that land by the agency of Moses and took them through the desert and protected them and fed them and sustained them and gave them water to drink all through the desert. And that even when they went out, when they got to the promised land and said, no, we can't make it there and uh, God's not going to enable us to conquer this land like he said he would, that then he sent them back into the wilderness for 40 years for that unbelieving generation to die off but even during that time, continued to protect and sustain them. And then after that, uh, Moses died and Joshua led the people into the land and God performed 
awesome miracles to destroy cities and to rout armies before his people so that they could settle into that land. And God did miracles like that again and again through the period of the judges, these avengers who rose up to save Israel against foreign invaders time and time again. And how God did the same thing at the hands of his early kings, Saul and then David. And and Habakkuk knows all these stories. He knows that God has done all of these awesome things and all these awesome works. Every Israelite knew that. And, And Habakkuk is saying, I've heard of it, God. I've heard the stories of the things you've done. And I stand in awe of the things you've done and now renew them in our day. Revive them in our day. Make them happen again. Make them live again in our time. Make them known. Do it all over again. And then he says, in wrath, remember mercy. Now, those words in verse 2, in wrath, remember mercy, are, are written in such a way that would lead you to believe that what Habakkuk is saying is, God, you are angry at us for our sins, but don't be angry at us forever. Remember your compassion for your people. Remember how merciful you are and put away your wrath and show mercy for us. And, and that principle, that theme, does show up a, a lot in the Old Testament. It shows up a lot in the Psalms and it shows up a lot in the rest of the prophets. However, those words, in wrath remember mercy, in the Hebrew, could also be translated something more like this. Remember mercy with wrath. In other words, remember mercy angrily. And I think based on the rest of Habakkuk 3, that's more what he means there. He's saying, remember your compassion for us, your people, while the bad guys are winning. While there are bad guys among us now who are winning and oppressing the rest of us, and there are other bad guys in Babylon that you've told us are coming this way. And we want you to remember, God, I want you to remember your compassion for us angrily. Remember your compassion for us by being angry against those who do wrong. By being angry at injustice. By being angry at oppression. By being angry at violence. By being angry at wrongdoing. There is a place for anger. Now, often we don't fall into that place when we're angry because our point of view is so small. The ground we stand on is so narrow. So when we are hurt, when we're wrong, when we believe we're mistreated, all we can see in those moments, most of the time, is the evil of the person who we believe caused us pain and the righteousness of ourselves. That's all we can see. Now, God has a much, much bigger perspective. And he's able to see um, all of the factors that led into the hurt that we suffered, including our own wrongdoing in that. And so very often, our anger is, is not a righteous thing. So as, as James says in the book of James in the New Testament, my brothers, be, in James chapter 1, he says, My brothers, be quick to listen, be slow to speak, be slow to become angry. Because human anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Okay? So, so our anger usually is flawed or askew in some way, and, and we need the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to point out to us how it's off-centered, how it's askew, so that we deal with that anger in a proper way, which, which generally involves forbearance and forgiveness towards those who have wronged us. But, Anger itself, especially if you're pure like God and there's no sin in you, is not a bad thing when it's directed towards genuine injustice. And when it, it, is, it is handled, when it is acted on appropriately. And Habakkuk is crying out to God saying, God, remember your compassion for us angrily. Be angry at the wrong that is being done here. Be angry at evil. Be angry at sin. Be angry at the messed upness of this messed up world. And so what's really interesting about what follows 
is that I think we need to read what follows in light of um, uh, uh, Habakkuk 1.1, which is not quite right in the NIV. It says in the NIV, New International Version, the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received. But, but it's actually the oracle that, if, if I remember correctly, that Habakkuk the prophet saw. So, it, even though most of what follows is, is a conversation, it's words, Habakkuk saw some things in this. He saw visions in this. And it seems in Habakkuk 3 that he's describing a vision that he has seen. And the vision is of God coming to destroy the destroyers of his people. Coming to destroy the bad guys. Coming to win over the bad guys who won. And when God comes to do it, it looks like the most severe and violent storm you've ever seen. That's, that's what's being described here. And, and in, some, in some translations, it comes out a little bit more than others. But, but let's start with verse 3. God came from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. Now, that's not where you'd expect God to come from because typically in the Old Testament it says God comes from somewhere. It's, he's coming from His temple in Jerusalem. This is describing mountains that are far to the south of Judah. So you can picture Habakkuk like standing there in Judah and looking off to the south. And he sees these storm clouds gathering. Okay? And, and it says his glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Just, just picture when you see storm clouds that are on the horizon and you see these little flashes of lightning that are not striking the ground but are, but are in the thundercloud, right? Have you ever seen that where the, where the lightning is crossing within the clouds? These flashes that come out. It's like, it's like that thundercloud is the hand of God that's concealing this power, that's concealing this light, and it's glinting and glimmering out between his knuckles. Okay, And so here he comes. He, he's coming and he's, and he's covered with the cloud. Verse 5, plague went before him. Pestilence actually literally flashes, flames followed his steps. Okay, So again, this, this sort of lightning picture. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. Okay, The, the ancient mountains tremble crumbled and the old age old hills collapsed his ways are eternal right can you can you just picture when when there's a loud boom of thunder that that the windows rattle that the ground shakes right it, it's like god has taken his stand there in israel when he puts his feet down then the whole the whole earth shakes under that verse 7 i saw the tents of kushan in distress the dwellings of midian in anguish again this is not this is not good enough. So, so Kushan, we're not completely sure what that is, but Midian, we know, was a nomadic tribe, okay? That they lived in tents. They didn't live in houses. They lived in tents. And where it says that, that the dwellings of Midian are in anguish, in anguish literally means that they're shaking. It, and dwellings is literally curtains. The curtains of Midian are shaking. You can just picture this, this wind starting to blow, right? The storm wind is starting to blow. And, and the nomads who live out in the desert right who live in tents their tents are shaking right the the, the curtains are, are blowing in and out because the wind is starting to come the sand is starting to come it's starting to push and pour against those and they're quivering and they're about ready to get pulled up uprooted from the earth and blown away and so then in verse 8 were you angry with the rivers O lord was your wrath against the streams did you rage against the sea when you rode with your horses and your victorious chariots? Again, what, what does it sound like? What would it sound like to hear a whole army of chariots and horses driving by, right? Like trampling on the ground. It's like thunder, right? Like it's, it's, this, it's this thunderous, powerful noise. 
the, the, the picture then of God is he's riding his, his chariots and horses through the sky. The thunder is in the sky and it's shaking the whole place. Were you angry with the rivers, O Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you have such a problem with them that you would send so much rain to come down that they would rise up and the torrents would go down and would toss and would foam and would grab at the sides of the river banks? Verse 10, um, end of verse Uh, I'm sorry, rather, verse 9. You uncovered your bow. You called for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers as the rivers rise. The mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by or even literally swept over them. You think about the flood of Noah and the water going over the tops of the mountains. The deep roared and lifted its waves on high, right? Just, just imagine, just think about the, the pictures that we see on the Weather Channel of the hurricanes that have come through in the last month, you know, and how the waves come up and how the rain comes down, how the wind blows away. Verse 11, sun and moon stood still in the heavens. They are stopped, man. They're like, we're not getting involved in this. We are up there and covered up by these clouds at the glint of of your flying arrows at the lightning of your flashing spear. The, the lightning strikes are portrayed as the weapons of God, the glimmering in light that he's striking down onto the earth. And then all of this is borne onto the bad guys. Verse 12, in wrath you strode on the earth, and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one, that is your king, the, the king of Israel. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. Literally, that verse says, you smashed off the head of the house of wickedness. You, you smashed it down to its foundation, its neck. It's describing the, the decapitation of the bad guys by destroying its leader by this massive bludgeoning blow. Verse 14, with his own spear you pierced his head when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. At the very moment that they were excited that they were about ready to, to, to destroy me, Habakkuk says, to destroy me, to destroy my people, we weak and humbled, wretched people, and they were going to come and just rip us apart and consume everything among us. At that very moment you came and you destroyed them. Verse 15, you trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. All the foam of the sea is like of of the horses of God that are driving by. So this is this vision that Habakkuk sees. Now, at this point... You could imagine, and sometimes it shows up in the Old Testament, that, that when there's a picture of God coming in wrathful, violent judgment against the bad guys, and they finally get what's coming to them, that there's rejoicing and there's celebration by those who are uh, delivered by this. But look at Habakkuk's response. Habakkuk has a different response this time. Look at verse 16. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones, and my legs trembled. Yet, and don't read yet there, just read, I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Habakkuk is crying out in chapters 1 and 2, God, when are you going to do something about the bad guys? The bad guys win. When are you going to do something about the fact that they're winning? When are you going to do something? When are you going to do something? Then he gets a glimmer, he gets a picture of what it looks like when God actually does something. And it's terrifying. I mean, it is such a terrifying spectacle. It is so awesome. It is so dreadful that Habakkuk, even though he's being saved by it, even though he's not on the receiving end of it, can barely stand. He can't can't speak. He He is shaking at the sight of the majesty of God. And and I think there's a critical lesson for us here when we try to understand um, what to do when the bad guys win. When the bad guys win, if we really have a strong concept built on the Word of God of what the wrath of God looks like, 
I believe we will be much less vindictive against the bad guys. I, I really do. I think we'll be much less vindictive against the bad guys. Because we will be, we will realize that when God gets angry, I mean, God is slow to anger. I mean, it says in the Bible, He is slow to anger and He is abounding in love. It takes God a long time to get angry. For us, not so long, right? For us, we can get angry pretty quick. God takes a long time to get angry. Very, very long. But when God does get angry, He gets very, very angry. And when he acts on it, it is something that we can't even conceive of. When the creator of the universe, when the one who holds all of matter and energy in his hand and can extinguish it in a moment and shapes it to whatever it is he wants it to be, when he says enough is enough, whoa, right? Whoa. And, and when Habakkuk sees this, he's, he's not saying well, God, I didn't mean for you to go that far. I mean, you know, really you should have some mercy on him or let up on him. He doesn't say that. He's in favor of what God has done, but he's just stunned, astonished, dumbfounded by the magnitude of the power of God. And my friends, when the bad guys win and we feel so helpless and we feel like there's nothing we can do, we feel powerless we go into the word of God and we read Habakkuk 3 when we read Exodus 1 through 15 which describes the 10 plagues that God sent on Egypt to bring out his people when we read the book of Revelation and and Revelation which itself is this symbolic full of imagery crazy difficult to understand book like Habakkuk sometimes but when we when we get a grip of the magnitude of God's hatred of evil and what he is finally going to do about it, it calms us down. It backs us down. And it enables us to wait like Habakkuk waited. Because when the bad guys win, actually, God wins. And so Habakkuk then says this in verse 17, because it's not over yet. And verse 17 goes on to be one of the most beautiful passages in the entire Bible. He's looking ahead. He's thinking about what is coming. He's thinking about what's going to happen when the Babylonians do come to punish Judah for its sin. When all of the people of Judah who survived the initial onslaught retreat into cities to wait out the Babylonian siege, when all of their farmland is out and is being consumed and destroyed by this raping army that is coming through, and and the suffering that they're going to have to go through, the starvation that they're going to have to go through, the thirst that they're going to have to go through, just the terrible stuff they're going to have to go through during that horrible process while they suffer for their sins before God then does come and restores them. He says this, verse 17. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. I am going to exult in my God. I am going to celebrate his victory when we are at the worst point of defeat. Because I know that it's going to happen. I know that it's real. And again, when when the bad guys win, actually God wins. And we learn from Habakkuk that when we really get that down deep inside us of his ultimate victory that is coming, his kingdom that is coming when Jesus returns, then and only then we can cheer for God. We can be ecstatic and excited about God because we know we're on the winning side even when we're starving. And then Habakkuk says in verse 19, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. Who wants to go on the heights? Who wants to go on the heights? When the bad guys win and you feel so downtrodden and you feel so helpless and so powerless, 
The last place you feel like you are is the heights. But Habakkuk says, the sovereign Lord is my strength. And even here, even now, I'm going to rejoice and I'm going to go up to my high places. My high places of prayer. My high places of sacrifice. My high places of worship. My high places of praise. I'm going to go up on my high places of joy because the sovereign Lord is my strength. When the bad guys win, actually, God wins. God wins. And as we drill down into Scripture and ground ourselves in it, we too can rejoice in our strength and go up on the high places. Let's pray right now.